Hello friends. Welcome to the Eastern Front channel. Today we will talk with you about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus adjutant, Arno von Lenski, who fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943. The telephone rattled storm, I was shaken out of my sleep. But before I could grasp the telephone I heard a distant rumbling, drum fire, I thought. The duty officer called, alarm, colonel, to the chief of staff immediately. That was the beginning of the Soviet counteroffensive. The calendar showed November 19, 1942. I put on my uniform tunic and boots and rushed to the headquarters section. Officers and soldiers were already gathering as if they had been torn from their sleep. The chief of staff, Major General Schmidt, had already put the whole army on alert. It was extremely serious, the tiring days of waiting, during which our gunners and tank crews lay beside their guns, were over. Our infantry loaded their machine guns for automatic fire and grasped their hand grenades, which lay ready within reach. Shortly afterwards the army commander-in-chief appeared beside Schmidt. The telephone rang, General Strecker, commander of the 11th Corps, reported. All hell's broken loose. An unimaginable drum fire is falling on our positions, the ground is being literally plowed up. We have enormous numbers of casualties, the main blow appears to have hit the Romanians. I telephoned my left-hand neighbors, the Romanian 4th Corps. Their commander was really pessimistic, he fears panic breaking out among his troops. Our divisions are at their posts but can see hardly anything through the snow, we will keep army headquarters informed. Paulus gave Strecker the following briefing, to ensure the safety of your left flank, send the 14th Panzer Division southwest of Klatskaya. Go as close as you can as soon as the direction of the enemy attack is identified. Paulus put the telephone down, looked at us silently for a moment, then picked up the telephone again, connect me with Army Group B. An officer on the staff of the Army Group took the first report from the 6th Army about the enemy's artillery preparation. From then on the ringing of the telephone in the chief of staff's room hardly stopped. Reports, questions, orders chased each other, the withdrawal from the city of the 14th Panzer Corps was prepared. The Army High Command was informed by its liaison officer to the 6th Army, Major von Zitzewitz, who had relieved Major Menzel. But as yet we still did not know enough about the enemy's intentions and direction of attack. At about 7 a.m. General Strecker reported again, the enemy has gone into the attack from the bridgehead. We have been able to hold on to our position so far, the thrust is directed at the Romanian 3rd Army. The 376th Infantry Division informs us that the Russians have broken through the positions of the Romanian 4th Corps and are pushing south with tanks. The situation with the Romanian 1st Cavalry Division is completely unknown, it no longer has connection with its left-hand neighbor. I will pull back the 376th Infantry Division and put it to protect our flank with its front facing west. The telephone connection with the 44th Infantry Division has been destroyed. A motorcyclist reports that the shelling has almost destroyed the foremost positions, the red tanks have crushed everything the Romanians had. Paulus authorized the withdrawal of the 376th Infantry Division to a flanking position, ordering cooperation with the 14th Panzer Division, and attached the Romanian 1st Cavalry Division, which had been pushed eastwards, to the 11th Corps. From Army Group B we learned that the Soviet artillery had been firing thousands of tons of steel at the Romanian 3rd Army's positions for hours. Then two shock armies broke out of the bridgehead near Kletskaya and Serafimovich. The Romanians had defended themselves bravely, but were overrun and forced to flee. At this moment Soviet tank units carrying infantry and some cavalry units were thrusting unstoppably further south. Neither German nor Romanian command posts could say where the enemy spearheads were. Only one thing was certain, the 6th Army was already under threat from the rear. My attempts to get an idea of how many casualties the 11th Corps had suffered were equally unsuccessful. The Corps adjutant informed me that the telephone lines had been almost continuously broken since very early morning. In his opinion the 44th and 376th Infantry Divisions must have suffered severe casualties. For the Army Headquarters staff the November 19th passed in anxious waiting, catastrophic reports piled up hour after hour. 
Although by evening we still had no precise knowledge of the extent of the Soviet success, it was obvious to all of us that we were in deadly danger. At about 7 p.m. I went to Paulus for a conference, he was pacing back and forth, bent over, across the room. That he was more nervous than usual showed on his face, he stopped in front of me. Now has happened what I have been forecasting for weeks. Hitler does not want to accept as true what every simple soldier can see. Keitel and Jadl have supported him in this, for weeks we have had nothing but empty words. Now we have to dish out the soup, we have no idea if it is possible to stop the Russian counteroffensive. I nodded wordlessly, tormented by the same thoughts, angrily Paulus went on, the danger confronting us is gigantic. I see only one way out of this situation, turning away to the southwest, the fastest action is necessary. This was also my opinion, so I asked, in this case must the army really ask for a decision from the army high command, here we are talking about the lives of almost 330,000 men. Even if it is to be, or not to be, the whole of the 6th army goes. I have, as you know, asked to abandon Stalingrad, that was refused. There is still the order whereby no commander of an army group or an army has the right to relinquish a village, even a trench, without Hitler's consent. Of course the decision of every army commander has been paralyzed. But how will we get through the war if orders are no longer complied with? What effect would this have on the troops? However large the command of a general is, the men must be given an example of his soldiers' obedience to orders. This basic attitude also determined Paulus's conduct in the weeks to come. Even though the necessity of independent action was still compelling, Paulus did not even consider it. He remained an obedient general. In this he was backed by his temperamental, but also fanatical, chief of staff, Major General Schmidt, and most of the commanding generals. I too, despite many inner conflicts over these painful but also consequential considerations, fail to stand out. During the night of the 19th and November 20th, the army staff obtained a clearer picture of the situation. The 14th Panzer Division reported that the enemy had thrust about 30 kilometers into the hinterland with tanks and cavalry. Their artillery regiment had repulsed several strong attacks. Fresh news from the 11th Corps indicated that the Romanians had been attacked by strong tank units without offering any serious resistance, the tanks simply mowing down anything that stood in their way. Those Romanians still alive fled desperately to the south and east, the Romanian 3rd Army did not appear to exist anymore. Also many of our rear services had suffered a hard shock from the enemy storming south before them. Clearly no one on the staff could think of sleeping that night, all the section heads were assembled in Schmidt's office. Without any sign of internal excitement, he described the new situation west of the dawn and finished with these words. The move of the army headquarters to Nishi Cherskaya is to be prepared, orders have yet to come about the destruction of dispensable files, especially the secret ones. Schmidt's optimism and bubbling energy in this situation contrasted especially with Paulus's heavy sense of responsibility. To the chief of staff, the internal conflict of his commander-in-chief was alien. Schmidt was in his element, making decisions, issuing orders and controlling their execution. He was convinced that it would be possible to defeat the enemy despite the Russians' considerable initial success on the battlefield. He spread General Paulus's proposal, which he had worked on with the first general staff officer. It went, the 14th Panzer Corps with the Panzer Regiments of the 16th and 24th Panzer Divisions must reach the west bank of the Don, then strike the forces of the Red Army advancing from the heights west of Galyabinskia in the flank and destroy them. The staff of the 14th Panzer Corps will take over the Army's command post in Galyabinskia. The 14th Panzer Division will also be attached to it, the assault troop activities in the city are to cease immediately. All available troops on the fronts of the 8th and Corps will be withdrawn as reserves for the 6th Army. The bridgehead on the west bank of the Don west of Kalich will be reinforced by the engineer and anti-aircraft artillery courses with all dispensable troops from the rear services and placed under command of Colonel Mikosh. The officer cadet school in Suvorovsky is to be ready to move, Army headquarters will move on the November 21st to Nishi Cherskaya, Colonel Adam is responsible for the move. 
Wounded and not required supply troops will be moved to the area south of Chur, where the Russian attack is threatening the railway line and with it the main supply route. Paulus approved this proposal, the orders were prepared and distributed to the units. Midnight was long past, and no new reports were expected before daybreak. For the moment there was nothing to do at army headquarters, so I escorted Paulus to his quarters. On the way he started talking, if Führer headquarters had allowed my proposal to withdraw the 6th army behind the dawn, we would have been spared this difficult crisis. Hopefully Hitler and his entourage have now at least some understanding and will order the city to be abandoned. That is no longer easy today with the whole of the Romanian 3rd Army knocked out of the Don front. The Russian tank and cavalry units have practically no one in front of them, I have little faith that Heim's 48th Panzer Corps can bring this thrust to a halt. If you are expecting such an order from Führer headquarters, General, it would be expedient to start preparatory measures. Temporarily I have proposed to army group pulling out all the troops from the city, obviously I cannot let this intention become known to the troops yet. That would only cause panic, and at the very least lead to a reduction in the will to resist, the corps staffs are already busy dealing with this question. At least it must be clear to them that the orders signed by me previously have the aim of extracting the army from the threatened encirclement. We had reached the commander-in-chief's accommodation, I excused myself and went back to my section. When I entered the room, Senior Sergeant Major Cupper got up from his desk, the other clerks were already asleep. So, Cupper, you are already up, we can get on with the work, it is already done, Colonel. You think so, you will be surprised, we will prepare all the dispensable files, especially the secret ones, for destruction. The remainder will be packed. The staff moves to Nizhny Cherskaya tomorrow. Ah, so that's the truth of it, yesterday I heard of it from various Corps dispatch writers. One from the 11th Corps said that the Russians had overrun the Romanians and pushed suddenly to the south. I took that for just a latrine rumor, but when I heard an hour later that you were still with the chief of staff, I sensed nothing good. That is why I am still awake, it must look very bad if we are already burning the files. Don't throw the flint into the corn yet, first of all we must be careful. We will wait to see what today brings, let the others sleep in peace, we will do the work ourselves. The senior sergeant major pulled the steel box containing the secret files from under the camp bed, opened it and gave me the papers one by one. I divided them into two heaps, papers that had to be destroyed when danger threatened, and those that were less secret, such as recommendations for awards, leave approvals, and so on. After this the stacks of paper were bundled up and put back in the box. As we were finishing, the day was already beginning to dawn. Go and get some sleep now, Cupper, I am going to my quarters to wash and shave myself. I will be back here at 8 am at the latest. Attack also from the south half an hour later I was standing shaving in front of the mirror in my bedroom, the telephone rang, what could have happened, I thought, as I pressed the telephone to my ear. Come immediately to the Chief of Staff, General Paulus is already here. I quickly finished shaving and hurried to the command section. The wind was cutting in my face and into my skin under the not winter-proofed clothing. Individual snowflakes settled on the field gray or ran down the chin and cheeks. In Schmidt's room a large white chalked clay farm stove maintained a pleasant temperature. The Commander-in-Chief was standing with the Chief of Staff before the map hanging on the wall. The depiction of the latest situation had begun, I stared bewitched at the entries. In the 4th Panzer Army's area was a thick red arrow going through its forward positions, the Soviet Army had also entered from a southerly direction. Paulus pulled it all together, the enemy early this morning, after a strong artillery preparation, attacked the positions of the 4th Panzer Army and the Romanian 4th Army. The situation there at the moment is not clear, the Red Army is pursuing its attack from the north here. Its left hand group is going in a southeasterly direction on Virchenview Sintka. We must therefore reckon that the 11th Corps' route to the south will be blocked within a few hours. The greatest danger lies here with the railway line from Morosovsk to Chur Station. So we were right up to our necks in it, the Soviet High Command was pressing both fangs together. We tried to prevent this with a counterattack by the 14th Corps and the 48th Panzer Corps. 
But what if this attempt failed? What if our armored forces proved too weak? Then the enemy would tighten the noose and the 6th army would be caught in a cauldron. I paced my little office restlessly, three steps forward, three steps back. When I tried to relax, my thoughts immediately returned to the situation map. The red attack arrows threatened nightmarishly, upon extension they would meet near Kalich. But something must happen, would our panzer regiments attack in time to remove the threat to the rear of the 6th army? What would the next few hours bring? The answer came more quickly than I would have liked, Paulus had me summoned. I entered a room that was dense with cigarette smoke and hung with thick blue clouds. The ashtrays on the tables were full to the top, among them, still untouched, stood a cup of black coffee. You know, Adam, that Major General Basler took over the 14th Panzer Division a few weeks ago. Today the general has reported sick, apparently it's an old heart problem that has come up again. He asked my permission to drive back to the homeland, I have agreed. A commander who reports sick in this situation is useless and becomes a burden to the troops. This well-nourished gentleman was already unsympathetic when I saw him for the first time. Nevertheless I would not have believed that he would leave his troops in the lurch in this dangerous situation, that is desertion. This is to make it clear that we must leave it to the army group, I have informed them of the foregoing. General Basler was in such a hurry that he should soon be with them. The 14th Panzer Division reported to Schmidt that Basler was already on the way in his car to Chur Station. He has not even considered it necessary to wait for the arrival of his replacement, a shame that he should be a general. Basler is not only an officer who forgets his duty, the day before yesterday, with the first reports of enemy activity, he became already afraid and failed to spare his troops unnecessary casualties. A courier officer from the 14th Panzer Division told me that there was a serious dispute between the bestseller and his staff. I am not taken in by his sickness, in soldiers' language this rates as cowardice, the gentleman is concerned about his precious life. Do we wait for the investigation, the personnel office will see to it. I want to know from them who the successor is to be, the division must still have a new commander today. Presuming that Major General Schmidt is agreeable, I propose Colonel Latman, commander of the Armored Artillery Regiment of the 16th Panzer Division. I consider him one of the most capable officers in this army, he is clever, agile, circumspect and energetic. Latman knows the armor to his fingertips, which in this complicated situation is especially important. Once Schmidt had accepted my proposal, Paulus too gave his approval. The Army Personnel Office was requested by teleprinter to permit this change of command of the 14th Panzer Division. A few hours later Colonel Latman reported to the Army staff in Galyabinskia, the Chief of Staff briefed him on the situation. The new divisional commander was not envied for his task. The 14th Panzer Division had already suffered considerable losses in the defensive fighting. Above all, its artillery regiment had been literally shot up by the enemy's tanks. Hours of unrest and uncertainty we lived through hours of unrest and uncertainty. Rumors of all kinds were circulating, no one knew where they came from, no one knew what was really happening. Had the enemy really interrupted the Don High Road to Cher Station, was it correct that he had reached the railway line from Morosovsk to the Don, that the 4th Panzer Army had been defeated? What measures had the Army High Command initiated to fight the rear of the 6th Army Free, where was the 48th Panzer Corps hiding? Had it attacked, with what results? Our nerves were at breaking point. At last, on the evening of the November 20th we had some information about the situation with our right-hand neighbor, the 4th Panzer Army. The enemy had broken through its defensive line from the south and was thrusting westwards towards the dawn. The 29th Motorized Infantry Division was tasked by the Army Group with blocking the breakthrough, but was incapable of stopping the attack. The 4th Corps and the Romanian 20th Infantry Division had been brushed aside and were now positioned with their front facing south. Nothing was known of the other Romanian division in the south, according to the latest reports the Soviet tanks were standing close in front of the 4th Panzer Army's headquarters. That was a fine mess, a gaping hole on our left flank and now also on the right, the enemy thrust with ever stronger forces through our shattered front. 
His attacking spearheads were rapidly getting closer, and we had no reserves with which to repulse this deadly danger. From Army Group we learned that the counterattack by the weakened 48th Panzer Corps under Lt. Gen. Heim had been easily checked. Our Luftwaffe, which perhaps could have relieved the situation, had been rendered inoperable by snowfalls. The Soviet tanks had reached the Liskatol from the north and were storming towards Kalich. Another group was rattling further south, the only supply railway coming from the west via Morosovsk to the Don and ending at Chur was under immediate threat. For the enemy the way south as far as the mouth of the Don at the Asav Lake was virtually open. That meant nothing less than that sooner or later the Russians would find themselves in the rear of Army Group, which was composed of the 1st Panzer Army and the 17th Army, and was operating in the Caucasus. Every one of us knew that we were confronting a catastrophe of inconceivable extent if the German side did not act quickly and powerfully, how could it be managed? This was only a small part of Arno von Lenski's memories. I am waiting for your discussions in the comments, also do not forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel see you all soon for now.